Hello everybody. For the past two episodes of this iceberg, we've been covering the absolute unit of a layer, layer 5. And this episode is no different. This is the second last episode of layer 5, so I hope you enjoy. This part contains 16 fan games. Get some popcorn and snuggle up, because this is going to be some very weird, wacky, and all around strange fan games in this episode. Zero's Tower Game is a game with the primary tower type being towers. The group is listed under the same name. However, the group and the game is created by Zero Caleb. The group has other games that they have created, but they are extensions of Zero's Tower Game. There is another game they own that is in the obscure layer 7 of the iceberg called Zero's Tower Game Archive. Inside that game, they only have 6 floors, where in the new and updated Zero's Tower game, the towers are 10 floors tall. The tower game was created at the start of August in 2020. The game has not remained the same throughout this time, still gaining updates as recent as days ago. A large update that may not have been acknowledged is the complete overhaul of Sector 1, which can be viewed in the archive. Entering the game will put you inside of a sector select. Rings are called sectors. Sector 1 is set in a dry location which matches up with its title of Turidity. Turidity is a general niche term to describe a very parched location that's usually scorched by the sun. Sector 1 has 11 towers, one steeple and one citadel between easy and insane difficulty. Ascending to the peak of the sector select is Sector 2 fittingly titled as Heights. This sector contains 13 towers, from easy to insane difficulty, precariously balancing on podiums. The last complete sector is Sector 3, Desolation. This sector contains 8 towers and a citadel, ranging from hard to insane difficulty. This sector is inside of a frosty tundra biome, with a cozy village in the middle. Unrelated note, but the soul crushing towers inside this game look so unique. Pressing the enter button will transport you into a loading screen, displaying a snapshot of the sector. Accompanying this screenshot will be a little quote, which can be re-rolled by simply pressing where the enter button would be. When it finally loads, you get transported to Sector 1. This section is basically one large sandcastle, which houses all of the lobby stuff. Credits, sky lobby, portals, difficulty chart, you get the point. The difficulty chart is very modern, containing the same difficulties as Duke's Towers of Hell, even having a moving stripe in the middle. Differing from the removed stars in JTOH, this game has tower rating crystals. These crystals tell if a tower is exceptional in any way. The awards have the same colours as normal, however the yellow star is gameplay and the blue star is a community favourite star. Sector 1 has a variety of awesome looking towers. The two which stand out the most to me are Tower of Troublesome Building, which is a mega collab. This tower has a really awesome design and has a deserved design star as a result. Tower of Curved Madness is the soul crushing in Sector 1. The sector select does not do this tower justice. Inside the game, it has a curved line of unique gameplay, however, I've been told that it's not the most enjoyable. I have only played some of the first floor, but the gameplay was very unique. Zero's tower game has a really promising sector one, and later sectors are sure to get better. Between's Rooms of Difficulty is a game created by Between Placements, and it features the frame type of rooms. You should know what rooms are by now. The name comes from the game housing a room per difficulty. Ironically, there is no difficulty chart inside the game. To be honest, there is not much content within the game. This is best demonstrated when you spawn into the game. The first thing you'll see and be familiar with is the spawn, which is a monochromatic room that has portals posed on top of a ledge. This old look isn't by choice, as the game goes all the way back to 2020. Not much modern influence has inspired the game either, as the last update was not far after the release in 2022. Jumping up the wedge and greeting the unusual portals will show the very unique approach between placements is taken. Instead of the traditional portal frame, Between's Rooms of Difficulty has three main parts of the portal. The first part is the base. This represents the difficulty of the room. The second part is the long neon line. This is the teleporter to get to the box. And just above it is the sign, describing the name and creator of the room. A key trend of the rooms is that every single room is created by the owner. Some rooms, such as Room of Trust Flicks, has a sign inside the room proclaiming that it's decorated by mind of everything. Room of Around Poles holds two special stars. The game does not tell you exactly what they mean, but it could be inferred that it means the room stands out. There's a high quality room for the fan game. However, it does lack a little bit in everything. The room is also intense difficulty. 
difficulty, meaning that it is slightly harder than the average difficulty of the section. The rooms in section 1 range from easy difficulty to insane difficulty, but they do not scale nicely. The easier rooms absolutely jolt up in difficulty, while the harder rooms barely differentiate in difficulty. Officially, the collection of rooms are called sections. This can be seen in the top right corner. Even if there is a leaderboard stat for the section number, to my knowledge no other sections are complete. But zooming out will show that there are a variety of other rooms, possibly in different sections, but I don't know how to get there. Let's move on to the menu, because this game has some unique settings. The menu contains three categories. Options, Info and Settings. The Options tab contains a teleport function which seems a little bit unbalanced. Imagine completing a catastrophic and your friend just teleports to the top and skips the entire thing. There's standard options too, such as show players, timer toggle, and spectate. The info tab just contains a button telling you the specifics of the last update. The settings is very interesting as it contains the colour option. This allows for the boring confinement of a spawn to be decorated with whatever colour you desire. This option also changes the colour of the boxes too, creating the dull studded room into a bright studded room. It alters various things inside the game which you can see. The setting option also contains the restart delay. Interestingly, between rooms of difficulty was planned to have a practice place. Touching it now does nothing. Between rooms of difficulty is a game that I would not play but it has some interesting features. Easy Towers of Hell is exactly what it sounds like. All of the towers in the game are easy and difficult. This game holds not much content, but the content that it does hold is pridefully shown in the game's featured photos. They are outdated and lying to you though. In reality, there are four towers. The towers inside the game are all created by the owner, who is Moo Moo Manager, and range in difficulty between easy and medium difficulty. There is a custom difficulty in between called moderate, and there is one moderate difficulty tower. Entering the game will immediately place you inside of the lobby as there is no ring select. While the lobby is very simple, the towers honestly are not as homemade as they look. Even if there is nothing inside the towers when viewing from the lobby, entering a tower will spawn you inside the frame with some pretty decent looking gameplay. The tower is accompanied by a title at the top middle of the screen restating the acronym. The bottom of the screen has a music button to enable and disable music. There are four towers inside the game. Tower of Impossibly Easy, Tower of Calm Ascent, Tower of Spectral Illusions, and Tower of Freedom. The tower categories clump towers of the same difficulty together, rather than having a spread of difficulties per category. There are the Easy Towers, Moderate Towers, Medium Towers, and Moderate Towers. The Moderate and Medium Towers are inaccessible without beating towers. They have a barrier surrounding them that demands to beat n number of towers to access. There would be more categories if the difficulty chart was finished, which is the first fan game we have encountered with an unfinished difficulty chart. Next to the unfinished difficulty chart is a tube with a quill inside. The quill can be attained for a crisp 40 robux. The tower portals are very different from the standard tower portals we all know and love. Easy Towers of Hell has a very blocky and precise portal. The name and builder credits are embedded into the design. These portals are a result of the game's old age being created in 2021. Surprisingly, the game has gotten an update semi-recently in April 2024. They added the current hardest tower, Tower of Freedom. Generally, all of the towers within the game are alright in quality. They are not special in any way. Something that is a little goofy is falling down the tower's podium in any way will require you to do an obby way harder than the tower to get back. Another strange thing is that the game has a low detail mode script that removes tower's obstacles if you're not inside them. This is despite the game having no client objects, at least in the older towers. Easy Towers of Hell feels like an unfavoured offspring of the Noob Zone Towers. You probably know what a convention is. It's commonly known to be a gathering of people that all have the same interest. This game has the same gist. It's a collection of whitelisted towers in Duke's Towers of Hell that have exceptional qualities that are not currently inside Duke's Towers of Hell. Duke's Towers of Hell Convention 2 is owned by Temer8724, who is a key builder in many other fan games and even has a handful of towers inside JTOH itself. He also owns a variety of other towers. This game is a restructure of a predecessor game called Duke's Towers of Hell Convention. The original fan game is much more popular than the revamp, amassing an impressive 200,000 visits. Anyway, this fan game has gathered around one ninth of the original visits, standing at 24k visits. Loading into the game will spawn 
spawn you inside of a satellite. The spawn platform is hovering over the middle of a really long glass tube. Above this satellite is another satellite holding the citadel portals. These citadel portals can be accessed by the left teleporter on the main platform. Glancing to the distant end of the satellite will show many portals aligning the sides. To be exact, there's 71 portals according to the wiki page on this game. The wiki page is a user blog by ABM Creative and it lists off all of the towers inside of JTOH Convention 2. This wiki page is outdated, being from the 16th of May 2022, not long after Duke's Towers of Hell Convention 2 was published. The outdatedness of the game does not change too much as the game does not get many updates anymore. To classify for JTOH Convention 2, towers need to be high quality and submitted to a community discord as a booth. The decorations that surround a tower portal is referred to as a booth. The first booth on the right side is Tower of Jazz, one of Temer's towers that are inside Duke's Towers of Hell. On the main path there are two conveyors which leads towards and away from the spawn. They are there to make it easier to traverse the elongated hallways. If you just wanted to see a tower all the way at the end, there is a teleporter on the right of the spawn that teleports you straight to the most recently added towers. While browsing the portals, a calm melodic track plays in the background. This is a custom soundtrack created by Cyber Vortex. You are listening to the soundtrack right now. This game has one secret that I will show you, so now skip 10 seconds if you want to find it yourself. The secret is found by going to the left, jumping under this platform and doing the short obby. This will take you to Pillar of Purple Burble, which is the only badge that you can get inside the game. It's a challenging difficulty purple pillar of respectable quality. Duke's Towers of Hell Convention 2 gives off heavy The Portal Project vibes. It feels like an expanded version of the concept and it's cool. Infinity J2H RPG is a take on the role-playing game genre, combined with the obby platformer Duke's Towers of Hell. It is primarily inspired by two games, J2H RPG and Infinity RPG. J2H RPG is a game which was covered in Layer 2, and Infinity RPG is a large RPG-based game that has a variety of weapons that you can use to obliterate monsters. Apart from the sheer quantity of weapons, it's just a pretty well-made RPG game. A combination of these two games creates Infinity J2H RPG. This game has all the monsters, weapons, and armor found in other J2H-based RPG games. The game was recently released in 2022 and is still receiving infrequent updates. The game is listed under the group, The Great Union of Roblox Noobs, which is owned by Angry Word Slayer. This group has other games that are not related to Duke's Tales of Hell, such as Measure Your Roblox Character in Feet, Meters, Centimeters, RPG Adventure, Noob Attack, and a few more. Joining the game will spawn you inside of a closed hilly grassland. There are necessities found inside RPG games like this, such as a healing fountain and a tutorial. There's qualities from Duke's Tales of Hell too, such as a difficulty chart and a hint legend. However, the difficulty chart's not used. Scattered around the environment are enemies. These enemies are not from J tier or H towers, but rather from completely different towers. The first enemy you will encounter is TON Minion. This enemy is the weakest and is the minion of the easiest boss called Tower of Noob. There are many towers with very interesting names, such as that. You might have also noticed the UI on the side. This UI is from the popular J tier or H RPG, the original one. The progression inside the game is very, let's say, busted. Many of the enemies are broken, so it's easy to just stand in one spot and attack them while they helplessly tank the shots until they are gone. Progressing requires getting better weapons and armor. Armor is gained by leveling up from experience dropped by enemies. Armor also improves your speed, jump boost, and health. While weapons are chance drops from enemies, different enemies have different chances of dropping a desired weapon. There are three categories of monsters. Master monsters, expert monsters, and minions. In essence, master monsters are the bosses. They have way higher health than rest of the enemies. However, are able to drop a weapon 100% of the time. Expert monsters are basically the mini boss. They have more health, but only have a set chance to drop a desired weapon. Minions are only able to drop experience, and in the future, gold. As the tutorial describes, you can get gold by killing the universe one boss. It also says that future universes will give gold. The first world you spawn in is Universe 1. Currently, this is the only complete universe of monsters. In the future, Angry Word Slayer hopes to add many more worlds containing new enemies. The game also contains additional movement options. You can dash by pressing Q or this button on mobile, you can slide by pressing E or this button on mobile, and you can double jump just by pressing the jump button twice. While this is a cool imagining of a JTOH based RPG, it doesn't have the qualities other JTOH based RPGs do. It's still cool nonetheless. 
The Wacky Spies is a fan game revolving around the mechanic of scaling spies that follows strange themes and ideas. This fan game dates back to 2020 but has received an update near the start of 2024. While its goal in development is to revamp the game, not much progress has happened recently. The Wacky Spies used to be booming in popularity around 2021. This is where it fostered most of its community and the 18,000 visits it has. The game is created under the group Mental Breakdown Studio. The group is owned by TrackDev. The description of Mental Breakdown Studio reads, Devs are still learning to bear with us. Which is some context on how their only game, The Wacky Spires, came to fruition. Entering the game will not place you into a ring select, but rather immediately inside a set of linked sky islands. There are five main sky islands. The island you spawn on contains a variety of nature and a few wacky decorations, such as delicious carrot-infused consumables and bubbles. Walking forward will bring you to the portal and spire island. This island consists of seven mini islands surrounding it which actually hold the content of the game. On top of the actual island is Spire Difficulty Meter and Spire Rage Meter. These roughly rank what they say. They are not compared to a reference, just how they feel based on each other. Normally, spires are defined as having four floors, one less than the smallest steeple size. However, in this game, a spire is a frameless obby that ascends to be a rough amount of studs high. I don't know how high they are. The next island directly behind the spawn is more like a bridge than anything else. It does hold an inactive portal linking to the area select. This portal is unfinished and will most likely be forever, unless this game gets revived. The next island is to the left, and is the Pufferfish Therapy. Instead of going for a traditional animal therapy, you get to see Norm, Ronnie, Johnny and Bonnie, and Mortimer. The last island holds the developers who made all of this happen. The Wacky Spires have held events in the past too, the most iconic one being the 2021 Christmas event. This event contained Christmas Tree Spire, which is now removed, and upon completion it rewarded a tree branch item. The tree branch item summons a Christmas tree where your cursor is when you click. There is a secret spire called Omega Spire 2. This spire is just a bunch of parts mashed together. I have no idea where it's located. There are also other secrets hidden around the islands as well. You can find them yourself. Unfortunately, due to the age of the game and lack of updates, the game has no music. This is unfortunate as the Wacky Spires indicates that it had a custom soundtrack created by Great Bird. The variety of spies is lots of fun to play and I greatly recommend this game, especially if it's your first time seeing it. Top Towers of Hell is a fan game with one goal, to house a large library of the hardest J2H towers completed. The difficulty chart follows the same general trend as Pit of Misery. The easiest difficulties are at the top while the hardest difficulties are at the bottom. The game is created by Yellow78Dog, who is a very skilled obbyist, beating the current hardest obbies to ever exist on Roblox. He has completed Stairway to Heaven and towers harder than horrific difficulties such as Tower of Wigglecore and Tower of Spiralling Fates. Other notable obbyists have helped with the development of Top Towers of Hell 2. A6IQ1 who owns Pit of Misery Nerfed, a game we have covered in Layer 4, also has collaborated inside this project. The difficulty chart ranges from easy to unreal difficulty. Contrary to what the game's name says, this is not the peak of difficulty in J2H fan games. Top Towers of Hell is a fairly recent fan game too, being released in July 2024 and quickly garnering a sizable following of 14,000 visits. It's a very active fan game being constantly updated. Entering the game will place you inside of a dingy monochrome lobby located on a set of islands. The towers are located on islands adjacent to the main spawn island. The towers are grouped based on difficulty. There are four groups of towers. The Terrifying Towers, Catastrophic Towers, Horrific Towers, and Unreal Towers. All of these towers are incredibly difficult and next to impossible. On the main island, a difficulty chart is imposed in front of the spawn. There is a sign next to the difficulty chart stating, If you click the tower acronym, it will teleport you into the tower. Unfortunately, this does not work on mobile. There are 16 towers and 2 steeples in the first ring. This might be the only ring, as there is no indication of there being a ring select. Going into the settings will show you a very nice UI with usual features and a practice button. Enabling the setting will provide you with no clip and god mode, however you cannot just fly over to the wind pad. Many of the towers look incredibly high quality and well made. This game hosts towers that you probably already know about, such as Tower of Cataclysmic Layers and Tower of Lucas Pentado. Obviously I am not good enough to beat any of these towers, but I can say that the atmosphere the game develops is great. I am excited to see what the future of this game holds. Coop's Towers of Difficulty Chart is a game that has been inspired by Tower of Generation Failure on Difficulty Chart. 
This game has came to great success after the trend of insert tower name here difficulty chart, such as Tower of Hopeless Hell difficulty chart, Tower of Elongated Runs difficulty chart, and Tower of Annoyingly Simple Trials difficulty chart. This was the most popular thing inside the Tower Obian community at one point. A difficulty chart like Tower increases in difficulty the further you progress. Floor 1 starts off at easy, all the way to floor 10, which ends off at catastrophic. Some floors may skip difficulties or have two difficulties in the singular floor. This trend was at its peak popularity around three years ago, with many towers being transformed into the difficulty chart format. While the trend lies dormant today, it still influences the increasing difficulty in modern towers the further you progress. Coop's Towers of Difficulty Chart is owned by Coop X Lee, who is currently banned from Roblox. The game hosts six different towers that have been turned into difficulty charts. Ironically, the game does not have Tower of Difficulty Chart itself. If you have wanted to practice any of the towers, you are in luck, as the game has a practice place. Loading into the game will spawn you inside of a set of floating islands. The main spawn island is the largest and there's two layers of tower portals. Both layers have four tower portals each. However, only six teleporters actually teleport you to a tower. Located on the bottom layer is a difficulty chart. This difficulty chart has the soul crushing difficulties. The current easiest tower is Tower of Annoyingly Simple Trials difficulty chart, and the hardest is Tower of Strategic Mechanics difficulty chart, which deserves an honourable mention. Tower of Strategic Mechanics difficulty chart is much more unique than the rest of the difficulty chart towers. The gameplay found inside the B-sides descend in difficulty, while the gameplay outside ascends. This transforms the punishing part to be much more laborious and punishing than it already is, contributing to its mid-terrifying difficulty. When a tower is turned into a difficulty chart, the game refers to the tower as being revamped. The people who altered the gameplay are called the revamper. This is seen on a sign that sits on top of the tower portal. Looking around to the islands which hold the towers shows a very unique yet niche detail. The islands look like they are from Zone 4. They have a band around it which displays the tower's original difficulty. So Tower of Annoyingly Simple Trials has a green band, while Tower of Elongated Runs has a white band. Most of the towers inside the game are easier in difficulty than their non-difficulty chart counterparts. As far as I can tell, the towers are of pretty reasonable quality and are not too unbalanced. However, take this with a grain of salt, as I struggle to get to intense floor and mobile. Thankfully, the game gives you Trail Mix of Heck, a healing item from Duke's Towers of Health. The concept the game utilises has lots of potential. With popular fan games already remixing existing towers inside Duke's Towers of Hell, a revamp of this game would have huge potential within the Duke's Towers of Hell fan game landscape. Cat's Towers of Ascension is a JTOH fan game which mainly uses the tower type of towers. It was not always called Cat's Towers of Ascension, rather it used to be called Twist's Unique Towers of Weirdness. This was until the former owner of the game, Twist and Troubles, retired from owning the game and passed it on to the current owner of the game, Premium Cat. Twist's unique Towers of Weirdness is still up and able to be played, and it's covered later down in the iceberg. For now, just think of it as a predecessor to the game we are talking about today. Premium Cat owns a few other games, a majority of them being towers they have built, and KTOA Portal plays. Think of this game as the Portal Project, but for towers only found in KTOA. This game is covered at the very bottom of the iceberg too, so we won't dive too deep into it. The current game we are playing, Cat's Towers of Ascension, is not the most recent version, as it has been made public to revive development on the, on the newer, improved Cat's Towers of Ascension. Anyhow, this game was created on December 2021, and is still running fairly strong. Updates that are pretty recent are still being published, however they are nothing major. Entering the game will place you inside of a nice scene. While there are no towers to be seen, the vaporwave-like skybox is still a beautiful sight to see. The menu at the side of the screen is the fairly standard design adopted by a large range of ring selects. Over the ring select a calming tune plays that perfectly fits the atmosphere. Rings are called gates, and the first gate you encounter is called Gate Zero, Nowhere Island. A joke to the lack of an island on the gate select. Gate Zero isn't an official permanent area within the game, but rather a temporary hangout for potential towers in future areas. This gate holds 14 towers currently. Moving on to the next gate will bring us to Gate 1, Daybreak Isle. This is the planned first gate within KTOA, and the tower difficulties show that there is one tower of each difficulty on the difficulty chart. In the middle of the screen, you can see yourself as a grey shadow. 
Entering gate zero will bring you to a nice lobby, which is on top of a massive island with a town in the middle of it. There is a difficulty chart which is posed in front of the spawn. This difficulty chart is very polished, and is mostly the same as Duke's Towers of Hell, except for Intense being pink, Remorseless being purple, and Catastrophic, which is now teal, meaning that every soul crushing is some shade of blue. There are signs clearly guiding your journey when you hike around spawn. Cat's Towers of Ascension has a mascot, its name is Pablo. This cube has cat features on it, there's an indication that points to Pablo's being a restaurant. The paths that diverge from spawn take you to the towers. You might have noticed that some of the towers are built by very renowned builders such as Chloe and Zachro21. The towers range from being very recent to very old too, with Tower of Odd Ideas being in the original Twist's unique Towers of Weirdness. There are many other parts of the lobby too, there's the unfrozen lake and even the museum which is unfinished. Around the lobby, lights and flora add atmosphere to the enchanting music. This is a very well constructed game with countless well made towers. For their goal to improve and fix many aspects of GTRH, they have done a remarkable job. Anonymous Cool Legacy Realm is the original version of Anonymous Cool Steeples. Anonymous Cool Steeples is covered later in the iceberg. The game is created by Diamond Anonymous who, as already stated, owns another JTRH fan game. The purpose of Anonymous Cool Legacy Realm is to be a time capsule which stores the old steeples and lobby. While the game is outdated, it doesn't aim to be a perfectly functional JTRH fan game. Despite this, the steeples and lobbies seem to be held to a high standard. Ring 1's lobby is set in a slightly hilly forest. The steeples which surround the lobby all look really good. Zooming out will pull us into the ring select, but before we get to the ring select, joining the game will show us a message which covers the whole screen. This message disclaims that you are joining the old version of Anonymous Cool Steeples and kindly asks, Would you like to join the reboot? Click no to get into Anonymous Cool Legacy Realm. The ring selects plays very slow atmospheric music that suits the feel of the game. Around the middle of each realm has a vector that the beam bounces off of. In this game, the beams are not the usual electric texture, but very uniquely a heartbeat from a heartbeat monitor. Thankfully, it's around a relaxed 60 beats per minute. The first ring has the setting we described before, a forest. There are a variety of steeples which are distributed around the area, ranging from easy difficulty to insane difficulty. The ring holds 12 steeples and one tower. Unfortunately, ring 2 is inaccessible for an unknown reason. If it were to be enterable, it would be located in a variety of ruined structures. It would have held one more steeple than ring 1. Ring 3 is the last ring with content in it. The blurb on the side is not very specific, just revealing that there's 9 towers inside this ring. It is placed in a biodome with some flowers. There is one more interesting thing inside the ring select, which is past rings 4, 5 and 6. This ring isn't officially titled as a ring, having the modest name of Lost Stadium. This looks like it was planned to be a final boss of Anonymous Cool Legacy Realm. Joining Ring 1 will spawn you inside of a lobby we have already covered before. The lobby comprises of all the necessary things you would expect, such as a difficulty chart, credits, practice lobby, and obviously steeple portals. The difficulty chart looks amazing with a stripe pattern texture. It holds the exact same difficulties found in Duke's Towers of Hell. Behind the difficulty chart, there is a star legend. This displays what stars displayed on tower portals actually mean. There is a yellow star which is awarded with the owner's complete and utter bias. There is also a length legend. This board is a guide to length markers found on top of tower portals. For a tower to be considered long, it has to be 6 to 14 minutes. For a tower to be considered ridiculously long, it needs to be 30 minutes. You can see the lengths on screen. The steeples are really fun and have a lot of care put into them. They look awesome and even have some cool mechanics. If you enjoy steeple games but don't like overly modern towers, this is a great game. The uniquely classical elements make for a great experience. I recommend checking it out. Z's Towers of Anger Reborn is a tower-based fan game created by Zman 2006 OP, who owns one other JTOH fan game called Z's Tower Nerfs, and another fan game inside of a group. Both are stowed lower in the iceberg. But before we get to Z's Towers of Anger Reborn, let's talk about Z's Towers of Anger. The original Z's Towers of Anger was created on Sandbox and then moved to Studio. Many of the towers and lobbies inside the original Z's Towers of Anger were revamped to create the game we are talking about today. The description is sort of cryptic, stating, This is a typical 
the JTRH fan game, but in this one, the rules are a little weird. It is unclear what the description is trying to convey. Entering the game will show you a very nice, but still pretty classic ring select. The top of the screen shows the title of the ring, while the bottom of the screen has additional information such as a description, controls, and world select. Ring 1, the sky, is the first thing you will see in the game. It's located in the sky, in a setting very similar to Ring 1 in Jutes Towers of Hell. Continuing on to Ring 2, River, will hold a mountainy area with a sizeable river flowing into the ocean. This large island is accompanied by other islands holding the towers inside the ring. It requires beating four towers to get to it. Moving to the last completed ring inside the game will bring us to Ring 3, Water Edge. This is sort of a mixed dirt and stone archipelago. There seems to be some sort of island volcano at the back of the ring. Progressing here will take 9 tower completions. Clicking on World 2 will bring us to Dimension 1, Otherworld. Dimensions are the equivalent of zones. Dimension 1 is located in a gloomy purple themed area. Dimension 1 is the only area inside the game that holds a sub-realm. This sub-realm is the pit of misery of Z's Towers of Anger Reborn. Only soul-crushing towers reside in the grimy depths of this cave. Compared to rings, dimensions hold more towers and are generally darker in style. Dimension 2, the flip side, has a pretty similar style to Dimension 1. It is placed on a rocky side inhabited by many types of mushrooms. It requires 4 towers to progress here. During your stay in the ring select, Z Pick Your Poison plays in the background. This isn't just a one-off soundtrack, Z-Man has created a custom tune for every lobby. Going back to the sky and entering ring 1 brings you to a nice inside of a building. This building Building contains two secrets and the difficulty chart. It contains the same difficulty seen in Duke's Towers of Hell, and even a joke unreal difficulty tower. Walking around the various houses and quirks of the lobby will bring you to the tower portals, which are unique. They contain a difficulty key next to him. The difficulty key estimates the average difficulty of each floor. This is a really unique addition to tower portals which more games should adapt. The towers which are distributed around the lobby all look great. Tower of Senseless Internal Pain is the extreme difficulty tower in Ring 1. Z-Man's favourite Ring 1 tower has a fun, classic wraparound based gameplay and a simplistic look. There are many other towers which I have had fun playing too. Z's Towers of Anger Reborn has a mix of great semi-classical towers with fun gameplay, interesting lobbies, and a great custom soundtrack. If you have some time to kill, I highly recommend this fan game. Hecht Tower Facilities is a tower-based fan game which facilitates many areas of content. It is owned under the group called Parkour Studios Official, which is owned by Light Surge. Light Surge owns two other fan games called Git Goods Epic Climbs of Rage and Git and T's Rage Endorsing Towers. This is Light Surge's newest fan game, being created on the 16th of July 2020. It still receives updates to today. Joining the game will enter you into a loading screen which has quotes down the bottom right. The massive title on the middle of the screen after some time will transition into a vibrant ring select. The ring select is overlaid with some menus. The left side of the screen shows the information about each base. Rings are called bases in the first world. Below the zone is a switch worlds button, which when pressed will take you to the areas. Areas are the zones of hecked tower facilities. The right side contains three main features. The check badges button does what the name says, the sub realms button is to represent the sub realms inside the game, and lastly arrows and the enter button. The top contains general information about you and the base, such as the requirements, the amount of tower points you have, the name of the base, and the difficulty spread throughout the base. Base 1 holds towers within the rocky confines of a beachside. This free to enter base contains towers from the easiest difficulty to the first soul crushing difficulty. Base 2 is a sweet treat after conquering base 1. It requires 4 tower points to enter and has the same difficulty spread as base 1. Base 3 is generally harder in difficulty. The towers are on average 1 difficulty harder than base 2. The hecked tower city requests for 10 tower points to be accessed. The second last completed base is base 4. Located by the water as a cliffside treehouse. There are some easy towers, but also a couple more harder towers than the last base. 16 tower points are required to access base 4. The last base that's inside the game so far is base 5, Abandoned War Zone, which takes 24 tower points to enter. This challenging setting is posed with the most challenging set of towers within the entire game. In addition to these bases, there is one area. Area 1 in World 2 is placed inside of a sophisticated cave system. Area 1 contains towers which are arguably harder than the ones you encounter in bases. 
Getting a feel for the game by entering base 1 will place us in a really tranquil forest area with houses that hold a variety of lobby features. There is a difficulty chart with a variety of custom difficulties. I'll put a mini model of it on screen with the J tier H difficulty equivalents to the right. The difficulty chart has a hyper category of difficulties. These difficulties are equivalent to soul crushing difficulties. The darker part on the back of the difficulty chart indicates them. The difficulty chart also has many frame types such as mini steeples, steeples, towers and bastions. Mini steeples are a sometimes hidden frame type which contains around 7 floors and a 20 by 20 by 20 stud floor size. You should know what steeples and towers are by now. Bastions are the citadel equivalent of hecked tower facilities. They usually contain 11 to 20 floors. The menu at the bottom right of the screen contains many more secrets and places to visit. Clicking the extras button will bring up many other places to visit such as the space station, the hub and timeless rift. Under these there is the tower progress button. This button opens up a screen which displays your dedication to completing the game. It lists all of the areas and bonus sub realms which exist. This game is excellent, it does so much right and has a lot of content. After playing a handful of towers inside base 1, I can say they are classical but fun. So if you like gameplay resembling rings 2 to 7 in J tier H, this will be a fun game for you. The Nini Neat Project is a game which is a continuation of the Not Even A Tower series. This is the sequel to The Nini Neat Project. The Nini Neat Project is created by Nikki Nikki Guess and is his second most popular fan game, gaining 15,500 visits over its lifespan. Each iteration of this fan game series shrinks the frame by around four times. This makes the frame as small as 3x3x3 three by three by three studs per floor. Towers scale up to 5 floors, so the final frame size of the Nee 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 are 3x15x3 three by by three studs, but they are not the smallest frames on this iceberg. Joining the game will take you to an area with portals that take you to rings and zones. These portals are placed inside of a completely black room. There are currently rings 1 to 3 and zone 1 that have any sort of development complete. The portals are super small too being the same size as the towel portals found inside the rings. Walking to any of the portals in this makeshift ring select will take you to the respective area. All rings apart from ring 1 are incomplete in some way. Ring 2 is missing citadel of wacky strategies and tower of difficulty chart. Ring 3 is missing citadel of heights and depths. And zone 1 is missing basically everything. All of the features of the ring are turned to be mini. This is especially true of the lobby. The lobby is shrunk to the point that it is lacking many features. The lobby does not have a therapy area, credits room, or even a difficulty chart. The missing difficulty chart does not change the difficulty of the Nee Nee Neats though, as almost every Nee Nee Neat is the same difficulty. Probably somewhere around mid easy or way below that. This is apart from two specific Nee Nee Neats. Definitely not a, definitely not a, and definitely not a laptop splitting is probably the most difficult thing you'll find in the game. It has a long outside section for this game, and the final 9 or 10 sub jump. Going to ring 2 for the second hardest thing inside the game will bring us to not even a, not even a, not even a, 1 equals 0. This tower is only difficult for one reason, the final jump. Missing this scary ladder jump will mean that you have to restart the entire tower, which is like 3 seconds, but anyway, it's punishing for this game. Certain Nee Nee Neats have some unique progressions, such as Not Even A, Not Even A, Not Even A Deep Darkness, which requires you to navigate down through the compact insides to get to the wind pad. And Definitely Not A, Definitely Not A, Definitely Not A Void which is a nee nee neat of Citadel of Void. While this unique progression is notable, it's surprisingly easy. It has both ascending, sideways, and descending sections. If you want to quickly beat a J2H fan game in less than 10 minutes, this is the game for you. Glister's Mortifying Tower Lobby Refined is a somewhat normal tower fan game. It is extremely ancient, dating back to April 2019 and it rarely gets updates today. The game is created by Glister, who owns one other fan game, which is the non-revamped version of Glister's Mortifying Tower Lobby. Glister is also a veteran of Roblox and JTRH, playing JTRH since 2018. Joining the game will put you inside of a very makeshift ring select. While the settings and towers look fairly nice, the UI looks pretty out of place with the towers beaten stat being cut off 
of the screen. The ring select shows a few features of each ring, a brief overview of what to expect, the average difficulty of the towers inside the ring, and navigation buttons to enter and navigate the ring select. Pressing either the forward or backward buttons will instantly transport you to the next or previous ring. Ring 1 is located in an oceanic based location. The average difficulty of towers inside this ring is difficult difficulty. Teleporting to ring 2 will show a much harder ring, as the average difficulty of towers is two difficulties higher than ring 1. This is accompanied by a much more rigid setting of stone shores. It requires three tower completions to get here. Ring 3 is the easiest ring so far, being average hard difficulty. This is because it's majorly comprised of a smaller frame type called spires. As indicated by the black play button, this ring is unfinished, hence unable to be entered. The ring select climbs up to ring 9, but none of these rings can be entered. The hardest planned ring is ring 7 Mars, which was planned to have a remorseless average difficulty. Past ring 6, the rings have a, a progression, very reminiscent to the zones in Duke's Towers of Hell. Entering ring 1 will take you to the very old and dated lobby, which is supposed to be a house. The first the first thing that is presented in front of you is the large difficulty chart. This has some difficulties that are the same as JT or H, but it mostly is comprised of original difficulties. I won't read them out because there are a lot. The lobby is filled with lots of towers, falling under tower categories. Glister's mortifying tower lobby refined uses unique tower categories. The tower categories in ascending difficulty are basic towers, moderate towers, veteran towers, and extreme towers. There is also a separate section for the citadel which in Ring 1 is called Citadel of Mortifying Timing. Walking into the Citadel portal will take you to a separate game where you have to complete the hardest thing in Ring 1. Each portal has a miniature difficulty chart next to it, with the difficulty of the tower being the most present. The lobby also contains the credits and an outside area, where you can glance at all of the towers inside the ring. There is also an emotes button at the top left of the screen, which is so goofy. Glister's Mortifying Tower Lobby is interesting. While not the highest quality of fan games, it definitely shows a new perspective on JTRH fan games. In Celeste, the B-side world has levels which are buffed versions of the respective A-side levels. This idea of a B-side has made for some great second worlds in other known platformer games such as Super Meat Boy and now Duke's Towers of Hell. Rather than the B-side having a buffed version of the towers inside Duke's Towers of Hell, it's more of a reimagining of the lobby and towers inside Duke's Towers of Hell. The game is created by Temer is Great, who derived inspiration from other remixes of Duke's Towers of Hell such as JTOHXL project. Temme is Great also creates a variety of high quality towers and citadels. JTRH B-Sides project is listed under a group of the same name. This fan game is fairly young, being created on December 12th, 2023, meaning it's less than a year old at the time of writing the script. Despite this, it has garnered a large following of 30,000 visits. Joining the game will place you inside of a very chill and beautiful ring select. As expected, the rings follow the same general setting and place as in Duke's Towers of Hell. Ring 1 is floating in the sky as the sky islands support behemoths of liminally similar towers. This ring has towers very similar to towers inside of Ring 1 of Jato, and this is evident from just the frames. From Citadel of Laptop splitting to Tower of Heck, the frames are recognisable. The UI shows the key features of the ring, such as a description, tower count, difficulty spread of towers, world select, and navigation buttons. Ring 1 is called Oblivion. Ring 2's lobby is generally planned, however, it is not released. There is a Zone 1, but it's a joke about the Great Centurial. Entering Ring 1 will place you inside of a setting reminiscent of the Sky Islands in Ring 1 of Duke's Towers of Hell. Walking around and viewing the portals will reveal the familiar names they have to their JTRH counterparts. An example of this is Citadel of Laptop Shattering and Tower of Enrage. Some portals hold a blue star. This blue star is the only star inside the game, and it is awarded for towers which are considered remarkable by the curators. There is also a difficulty chart, which is the same as Duke's Towers of Hell. However, the towers are different. The towers have similar frames and characteristics, but just aren't the same. They have the same vibe as the general tower. If a tower was inspiring in JTRH, then the same remake in JTRH B-Sides project would be inspiring too. This is most evident with Tower of Wowza, the remake of Tower of Killjoys. Tower of Wowza is an amazing tower. It's like if Citadel of Heights and Depths were to be difficult difficulty. Being the longest tower in the game, it has the unique wacky frame Tower of Killjoys has, and a few fun gimmicks. It carries the same daunting feel Tower of Killjoys conveys. 
I'll recommend trying out Tower of Wowzer as one of your first if you have the skill. J tier HB sides project is super cool, and I am intrigued to see where the future improvements and developments that's planned takes the game. Have you ever struggled to come up with steeple, tower, citadel, great citadel, or even great obelisk ideas? Well, this is the solution you never knew you needed. This game from July 2022 is created by Gloz666, who is now banned from Roblox. Because of this, JTRH Tower Generator does not get updated anymore. Since this isn't a nobby game, upon joining the game, you spawn on the spawn pad. In front of the spawn pad is a tiny island, which is where the towers are generated. On either side of the screen are menus. These menus contain a variety of options, so that you can customise the towers how you like. The menu that's opened by default is the Tower Stats menu. This menu contains the name of the tower, difficulty, floor count, if the frame is wacky, gameplay type, if there is a gradient, and a clear button. Either one of those buttons can be fixed, meaning that you are able to lock any of the stats. On the left side of the screen is the settings menu. This menu allows you to fix any of the colours, gradient, tower name, disable or enable orbits, frame wackiness, floor shape, floor count, hide the island the tower is generated on, disable or enable outlines, and change the mini frames width, height, and length. I know, there's a lot. You might ask, what do some of these mean? And we'll get into that now. Gradient colours refers to the colours of each floor in each position in the frame, while a gradient is a smooth transitioning between two colours. Orbits are the things that spin around a floor. They can look really cool. Classifying if a frame is wacky is asking, is the frame linear? If it does not follow a straight line, then it is wacky. Floors in the mini model have an outline, so disabling it disables the outline that surrounds a floor, and you are able to change the size of each individual floor. Upon joining the game, you have access to four coils to explore the behemoths you have generated. The coils are sending jump power from left to right. The classification of tower types aren't traditional either, as towers and facilities are interchangeable. Steeples are considered anything from 2 to 9 floors. Citadels are 11 to 29 floors. Obelisks are 30 to 99 floors. Great citadels are 100 to 499 floors. And monoliths are 500 to 1000 floors. And yes, you are able to generate stuff anywhere from 1 floor to 1000 floors. Strangely, this game is heaps of fun. Setting the floor height to 0.1 studs and the floor count to 1000 makes a lag abomination. Even just seeing the randomness of the default settings is interesting. It's a really interesting game. It would be pretty interesting to see someone try and use the ideas from this game to make an actual tower. Also, there is a website that does this too. Thank you so much for watching this episode. Thankfully, next episode, part 4 by the way, is the last of layer 5. This layer is an absolute beast and I am happy that it is finally coming to an end, so we can dive deeper into the unknown fan game iceberg. Anyway, thanks to my YouTube members, El Pasix, Elfie McBoy, and Twist and Troubles. I really appreciate you all. See ya!